Welcome to St. John's. We continue to journey with Paul as he encourages the Philippians. But just a few announcements before we get started. As we approach summer, we need your help at our Harvest Food Pantry to pass out fresh groceries to our neighbors in need every Saturday morning. We still require people to wear masks at the food pantry just to keep everybody safe. And you can sign up on our website or just show up on Saturday at 7.30 in the morning. We also welcome our newly ordained and installed elders, Joe Appleby, Lisa Blodgett, Matt Burns, Mark Lindenen, Susan Labushkin, Micah Russell, Jonathan Siegman, and John Young. We are so grateful for their willingness to lead St. John's as we live out the way God calls us to be present in our neighborhood and in our city. And now let us prepare for worship and open our hearts and minds to hear God's word. Let us worship God. Be thou my Today's scripture comes from the letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, and we're going to read the first 13 verses. Listen to the word of God. So then, my siblings, be glad in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to repeat the same things to you because they will help keep you on track. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for people who do evil things. Watch out for those who insist on circumcision, which is really mutilation. We are the circumcision. We are the ones who serve by God's spirit and who boast in Christ Jesus. We don't put our confidence in rituals performed on the body, though I have good reason to have this kind of confidence. If anyone has reason to put their confidence in physical advantages, I have even more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. With respect to observing the law, I'm a Pharisee. With respect to devotion to the faith, I harassed the church. With respect to righteousness under the law, I'm blameless. These things were my assets, but I wrote them off as a loss for the sake of Christ. But even beyond that, I consider everything a loss in comparison with the superior value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have lost everything for him, but what I lost I think of as sewer trash, so that I might gain Christ and be found in him, in Christ, I have a righteousness that is not my own and that does not come from the law, but rather from the faithfulness of Christ. It is the righteousness of God that is based on faith. The righteousness that I have come from knowing Christ, the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings. It includes being conformed to his death so that I may perhaps reach the goal of the resurrection of the dead. It's not that I have already reached this goal, or have already been perfected, but I pursue it so that I may grab hold of it because Christ grabbed hold of me. 
for just this purpose. Siblings, I myself don't think I've reached it, but I do this one thing. I forget about the things behind me and reach out for the things ahead of me. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever met someone or do you have a friend who has a way of boasting their accomplishments in any situation or turning the story back to them no matter how unrelated the topic is? Well, you may feel like Paul is just that kind of person. You got to love Paul because he certainly doesn't mince words and you might say that he has no problems in putting himself in a certain light. Paul may have changed and even transformed from a religious zealot who persecuted Christians to one of Christ's most loyal followers. However, one thing that hasn't changed is Paul's ability to brag about himself. Now, you may say that I'm being a little unfair to Paul. After all, he isn't flat out bragging about himself just to brag or boost his ego, But we all know that there are many different ways to the art of bragging. You've got your beneficence brag, where someone comes across as giving you advice by complimenting themselves. For example, a mother had her 11-month-old baby in a sling, and a well-meaning lady approaches her in the supermarket to say, the reason your child can't walk is because you're carrying it all the time. My baby was walking at seven months. And you know this is what the mother was really thinking. And then there's your humble brag, a.k.a. undercover brag, or better described as the Scooby-Doo brag. The humble brag is all about disguising a brag in some other more socially accepted, acceptable form. Most commonly, the brag is masked as a complaint. But why just do all the bragging yourself? It's much more fun if you involve others, such as the outsourced brag. If regular bragging is blowing one's own horn, outsourced bragging is blowing someone else's horn on their behalf. This takes teamwork. After all, it does say in Proverbs 27 too, let another praise you and and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Or try the brag FM brag. Doesn't necessarily require an FM radio. You simply have to follow these three easy steps. First, choose a public place like a coffee shop, public transportation, or any enclosed space where people tend to hang out. And next, simply rehash your best of moments. And lastly, do it with the volume turned up. Make sure to speak really loud so that everyone in the room can hear you. Otherwise, it doesn't count. Honestly, I don't think Paul did any of these. Paul just straight up puts it out there. He doesn't need someone else to do it for him. Today's reading begins with Paul saying, we don't put our confidence in rituals performed on the body, though I have good reason to have this kind of confidence. If anyone else has reason to put their confidence in physical advantages, I have even more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. I am the Hebrew of the Hebrews. With respect to observing the law, I'm a Pharisee. With respect to devotion to faith, I harassed the church. With respect to righteousness under the law, I am blameless can't get much clearer than that. But before we dismiss Paul as simply arrogant, he takes a turn saying, these things were my assets, but I wrote them off as a loss for the sake of Christ. Paul is sharing how his life was forever changed when he encountered Christ. He may still be a man who boasts, but instead of himself, he boasts about the Lord. Richard Rohr says, It's a gift to joyfully recognize and accept our own smallness and ordinariness. Then you are free with nothing to live up to, nothing to prove, and nothing to protect. Such freedom is my best description of Christian maturity. 
Because once you know that your I is great and one with God, you can ironically be quite content with a small and ordinary I. No grandstanding is necessary. Any question of your own importance or dignity has already been resolved once and for all and forever. Paul considers himself to be living in a state of in-betweenness, suspended in the middle of a journey. His existence resides in this liminal space of what lies behind and what lies ahead. And that is Paul's point. There is no ritual or goal or final revelation to achieve in the work of Christ. To know Christ is to live in a liminal space. It is to realize that no one has arrived yet. Everyone is on a journey in the process of making. We all possess within us intersecting identities that make up who we are and color the lens in which we see the world, as well as what perspective we gain. Along this journey of faith, every identity, whether religious, ethnic, racial, gender, etc., is a play, a dance, in between this binary of the beginning and the end. Paul reminds us that what is important along this journey is the importance of perspective. One of the ways that we gain perspective is by engaging in reflection on our past, present, and future, and how they come together in any given moment. Paul says, I myself don't think I've reached it, but I do this one thing. I forget about the things behind me and reach out for the things ahead of me. In other words, in order to gain a true perspective on our journey through life, we have to be able to engage our past with honest reflection. And of course, it's not easy to remember those things of which we are ashamed, as well as those ways in which we have experienced privilege or made significant achievements. But Paul reminds us that if anyone has something to be greatly ashamed of, if anyone has experienced a life of privilege, it has been him. Therefore, he is a co-journeyer with us. He doesn't ask anything of us that he too isn't doing himself. So what is different is that from the perspective of the present, Paul views his past differently. He evaluates it by a different standard and different values. His standard now is set by Christ and not his own ambitions. Therefore, he doesn't cling to whatever benefits he receives from privilege. For others who have never experienced privilege, it might mean claiming a heightened sense of self as a result of knowing themselves as persons with and whom by, with whom Christ dwells. How we reconcile our past and how we act in the present should affect how we proceed in the future. Paul cautions us that if we do not change or align ourselves with the values and priorities of Christ, then our present moment is destined to become the past that holds the roots out of which the future present will grow. We will continue to repeat the past instead of change for the future. So friends, with the encouragement of Paul, go and brag, whether it be humbly, within earshot, or direct from your mouth. What are we to brag about, you may ask? Start with what you have heard and need to constantly hear yourself. You are loved. You are enough. You are forgiven. You are seen and heard. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are not alone. Amen. As our prayer, I'd like to share this poem by Lawrence Ferlinghetti that really in a tongue in cheek way states kind of the realities of our world. And may it be a reminder of how we need to work to make this place beautiful. The world is a beautiful place to be born into if you don't mind happiness, not always being so very much fun. If you don't mind a touch of hell now and then, just when everything is fine. Because even in heaven, they don't sing all the time. And the world is a beautiful place to be born into if you don't mind some people dying all the time, or maybe only starving some of the time, which isn't half bad if it isn't to you. Oh, the world is a beautiful place to be born into if you don't much mind. A few dead minds in the higher places, 
or a bomb or two now and then in your upturned faces, or such other improprieties as our name brand society is prey to with its men of distinction and its men of extinction and its priests and other patrolmen and its various segregations and congressional investigations and other constipations that our full flesh is heir to. Yes, the world is the best place of all for a lot of such things as making the fun scene and making the love scene and making the sad scene and singing low songs and having inspirations and walking around looking at everything and spelling flowers and goosing statues and even thinking and kissing people and making babies and wearing pants and waving hats and dancing and going swimming in rivers on picnics in the middle of the summer and just generally living it up. Yes, but then right in the middle of it comes the smiling mortician. And so hear this blessing as you go about living life in the ways that God calls us to do so. Go now in the righteousness of faith and live by God's just demands. Let nothing claim your devotion above the Lord and count nothing of value above knowing Christ. Press on towards the ultimate prize of being one with him. And may God's perfect word revive your soul. May Christ Jesus be your savior and your rock. May the Holy Spirit strengthen you to press ever onward. Go in peace.